Hi, this is Sarit Schwetzer, and welcome to the It Is Taught podcast, a podcast devoted to the teachings of Rabbi Schneir Zalman of Liadi, as recorded in his most famous work, the Tanya. My hope for this show is to make these teachings accessible and relatable to the average person, regardless of prior Jewish education or affiliation. The episodes follow the prescribed daily study portions and are meant to serve as practical lessons in how to live your life as your true self and develop an authentic and powerful relationship with your Creator. I have personally experienced the effects the study of this work has had on me, and I'm excited to share what I can of this knowledge with you. So please join me on this journey of learning, self-growth, and connection with your source. Hi, and welcome to the It Is Top podcast. This is episode 355 for the 18th of Cheshvan in a leap year. Today, we are going to talk about sunglasses, something all of us kind of take for granted, right? So we all know that looking at the sun directly is harmful to our eyes, and we put on sunglasses and it makes it all better. But how do sunglasses actually work? What's going on? So what sunglasses are doing is two main things. They are reflecting certain light away from the glass so as to protect us from the overpowering rays of the sun or any rays like UV rays that might be harmful to us. But they're also absorbing light. They're, They're allowing certain light to come in. So sunglasses basically in short serve as a certain filter to allow us to receive the sunlight in a non-harmful way. So it's useful to think of sunglasses in this way as being a filter as opposed to glasses which block the sunlight because they don't block all of the sunlight. They they actually allow us to receive the sunlight, to see the sunlight. Um, so why are we talking about sunglasses and what, what does this have to do with the Tanya? So what we're going to be learning about today is that in Judaism, we actually have a parallel, an equivalent to sunglasses that allow us to receive the light of God in a similar fashion. And that th- those sunglasses, believe it or not, are the mitzvahs that God gave us, are the commandments that God gave us. So the way that this works, and we'll delve into this in a deeper way when we get into the text, is that the the uh, the mitzvahs, the commandments, they are actually made up of God's will. So they actually are made up of pure godliness. But the way that they are uh, formed, like the details of the mitzvahs, serve as a way that is accessible to us. It's like a filter. They serve as a filter of sorts that allow us to receive God's radiance in a way that we won't expire, in a way that's accessible to us, that's palatable to us. Which is why, which is something that's unique to the mitzvahs, by the way. So it's like when we think about Judaism, we can really say that Judaism and our relationship with God can be divided up into two categories. There's Torah and mitzvahs, right? And they're two different things. They're very related, obviously, but they they are two different things. So So Torah, as we've talked about many times on the podcast, Torah is the wisdom of God. It's the mind of God. It's it's God's intelligence, so to speak. And this is when we study Torah, we're tapping into God's mind, and God's mind in fact, is a very powerful thing. It's the basis of all of creation. It's where everything comes from, the origin of everything. But then there's the will of God. The will of God is the mitzvahs. And the will, if you've been following along in the and understanding kind of like the map of the spheros at this part, at this point, like the map of, uh, of spiritual reality, will actually comes It comes from a place that's higher than wisdom. When a person wants something, they sometimes want it in a way that that surpasses intellect. There's not like a logical reason for what they want. They just want it. It sort of like taps into the essence of their soul. Similarly with God, God's will is something very essential to him. And God's will is epitomized through the mitzvahs, the, the commandments that God gave us, that God tells us what to do, what not to do the Jewish law, that is God's express will. That's the the expression, express, expression of God's essence. So when we do God's commandments or when we learn about God's commandments, we're tapping into his essence. And these mitzvahs, as we'll learn, serve as sunglasses to allow us to tap into God's essence in a way that we won't expire, in a way that we can that can be accessible to us. Just like we can't look at the, the sun directly, even though the sun is pretty much responsible for our lives and for so much of the world 
but yet looking at it directly would and and it's responsible for us seeing color it's responsible for really everything we see around us but yet we can't look at it directly it would be too much for us we need those sunglasses in order to experience it so with all of this in mind we can come to understand the greatness of the mitzvahs and the greatness of studying the commandments of the Torah and why there's this like really high value that's given to studying specifically the mitzvahs and how the mitzvahs are actually called the crown of the Torah that surrounds the Torah. And how even though in a more manifest way, it can seem as if like the Torah is on top, the Torah is the one leading the show. Ultimately, uh, we know that in the future, it's going to be revealed that the mitzvahs are going to surround the Torah like a crown. And the mitzvahs actually, interestingly, are likened to the woman or likened to the wife, whereas Torah is likened to the husband. And this parallels the fact that in our world right now, in this state of exile that we live in, we know everybody talks about the patriarchy, toxic masculinity, that kind of stuff. All of that is a reflection of exile and the fact that like men are are in a position more of power in this state of exile. But in the times of Mashiach, it's actually going to be revealed that the women are the ones that are on top. The women are the ones that are more powerful and come from a higher spiritual place. So just a little bit of feminism to uh, to add in there. So with all of that in mind, let's get into the text and see how the Altar Rebbe explains this in his words. And for context, we are beginning a new epistle today, Epistle 29 of Iger Sakodesh. We are nearing towards the end of, uh, of Iger Sakodesh, believe it or not. We, we have just a few more epistles left until we come to the the final portion of the Tanya Kuntras Acharn. So stick with it. It's been an amazing journey. So here we go. So here we go. Beginning Epistle 29 of Iger Sakodesh. So the Epistle 29 begins with a a teaching, the Ultra Abyss starts off with a teaching from the Gemara in uh, Megillah, of chapter four of Megillah, where this section of Megillah is actually uh, elucidating upon a portion in a saying in Perke Avos, chapter one, Mishnah 13, which teaches that anybody who uses um, the crown uh, for personal gain passes away from this world. So the Gemara interprets this to mean, what is the crown? What is this making use of the crown? This is making use of the, this is the crown is a reference to the halachos, the laws of the Torah, which are the crown of Torah. And then the, the Gemara goes on to say that uh, it was taught in the school of Eliyahu that whoever studies halachos is guaranteed a place in the world to come. Okay, so this is the introduction to our epistle today. So um, to the to our section today. So basically, so it's so there's something very valuable about halachas that on the one hand they're called the crown, and in being called the crown, first of all, there's it's like you shouldn't use a crown for personal gain, right? So you shouldn't use the halachas for personal gain, and if you do, God forbid, if a person does this, then they're liable for death, basically. And if a person and and on the other hand, if a person studies these halachos seemingly with a good intention, then they are guaranteed a place in the world to come. So what is it about these halachas that make them so special? And to uh, to expand upon this question, the Altar Abed brings another teaching, this time also from the Gemara in, Mas in uh, Masechet Menachos, chapter 11, page 99b, where it talks about uh, where, it's, where it teaches that even if a person studies just one chapter in the morning and one chapter at night, then they fulfilled their obligation in studying the Torah. And it's understood in the Gemara that a reference to this studying one chapter in the morning, one chapter at night is specifically talking about the Mishnah, specifically talking about the oral Torah, which is an elucidation of the laws, again, about, about the halachas. So the Altar Rebbe asks a question, why specifically the Mishnah? Why, why is it that you fulfill your obligation through learning this section of the oral Torah? Um, as opposed to other Torah su subjects, like learning, like Chumash, for example. So, like you know, like like Torah is not just made up of of the Mishnah and and like the laws of the Torah, but there's you know there's stories of the Torah that that we learn and things like that. Um, so why why specifically is it concerning the laws? So the Altar Rebbe says that it's known that there's a teaching from from the Arizal that every person needs to come back in many different reincarnations until they fulfill all of the 613 mitzvahs of the Torah in thought, speech, and action. So 
basically, so we have this idea, right, that we're all supposed to keep uh, the 613 commandments of the Torah as a, as a Jew, but this isn't this doesn't always happen. It's like we're not perfect people, right? And we try our best, but like, <laughs> but chances are we're probably going to be lacking. And so, what happens is that a soul has to come back uh, in over and over and over again in order to eventually complete all of the 613 commandments. Uh, and what this does is this completes the garments of their soul and to uh, to rectify them so that they won't have any garment that's incomplete. So as we've learned about previously in the Tanya, we talked about this, how the mitzvahs serve as garments for the soul. And so if we want to have a complete set of garments, we don't want to be like lacking in any part of our garments. We need to do all of the commandments. And in order to do that, this, we have to come through many reincarnations. We need to be reborn many times. Um, and the ultra but does give a caveat for this. He says this, uh, this doesn't include the mitzvahs concerning a king. Because there's certain of these 613 commandments, so some of those mitzvahs only apply to a king, and it wouldn't be practical for everybody to be reincarnated at some point as a king. <laughs> like that just wouldn't be practical. So the way that this works is that the king, when he does his commandments, he is yotze. He um, he includes within all of him all of the Jewish people when he does this. So it's like the king, the king's commandments are. Uh, taken care of by the king. Uh, but all the other commandments, we need to do them. And so thus we need to be reincarnated many times. And um, the reason for this is in order to have the, the 613 aspects of a person's, the power of their soul, uh, to have them be fulfilled and not have them be lacking in, in any way. And this, the, uh, the, the need for these garments and the, and, and the reason why they're so important is explained in the Zohar. It's, it's, it's elucidated upon the Zohar and it's understood for any thinking person. So anybody who really thinks about it, anybody who really studies these ideas will understand why it's so important that the soul needs to wear all of these garments. Why? And now the ultra is going to explain this a little bit. He says, because... And this is where we're going to get into the sunglasses analogy. So, uh, so pay attention to that. So basically, so we know that there's um, there the there's three basic components of a person's soul, like as it's found within the body. So there's the nefesh, the ruach, and the neshama, as we've spoken about, right? So the nefesh, ruach, and neshama levels that are found within uh, these created people. So yes, these are soul levels, but nevertheless, these are creations by God. These are things that God created, and so. Yes, it's true that God shines his light from his uh, from his uh, blessed light and he emanated this in a way of many. He, this emanation goes down many, many different degrees through hishtalshalus, it's called in Hebrew, from level to level to level and goes through many, many tzimtzumim, many, many contractions, many intense contractions and many garments, vestments that are very intense, as is known to people who study Kabbalah, like we've spoken about these different levels many times, um, and to the point that it's called in the Idra Rabra as, uh, as Se'ar, as hairs. So it's like that God's emanation comes down, it, it gets so diluted, in a sense, it gets so contracted and constricted to the point that it's, that it's thought of as like hairs, that it's just like these little, little bits are coming down. As it says in in Daniel in chapter seven verse nine, kamar nake uh, that the hair of his head is like white wool. So this is a reference to this radiance that comes down like a, the hair of the head. Um, and nevertheless, even though it's such a small radiance that comes down, the nefesh or the ruach or the neshama cannot endure this light. It's too intense for them because it's very good and sweet. As is, as uh, as it's called, and where do we see that it's called good and sweet? Is this this is actually written in Tehillim chapter twenty seven verse four, where it says lechazot benoam Hashem, so uh, to behold the pleasantness of God. So this is referring to this idea of of God's radiance being pleasant and sweet, uh, and it, and it's talking about this intensity of the light. And also it says uh, in Yeshayahu chapter 50, 58 verse fourteen, as titanag al Hashem, then you will delight yourself in God. And also in Yeshayahu chapter 58, verse 11, and he will sate your soul with a pleasurable thirst. So this idea of pleasurable thirst, uh, this is related to the idea of 
which is like the, a, thir a thirst that cannot be sated, as it talks about in the Zohar. So meaning to say, so what is all the, what are all these citations a reference to is the idea that the soul does not have the ability to, as, as, um, as spiritual it is, it doesn't have the ability to absorb the sweetness and the pleasantness of this, of this thirst, um, without be becoming totally nullified, just like a, a flame of a candle would become nullified in a torch. So basically, like it's like if you were to take a candle and you were to shine it into like a bonfire or something like that, the flame of the candle would disappear, right? It wouldn't have any existence anymore um, because the bonfire flame overwhelms it. So it's the same thing here is that the soul, uh, as spiritual it is, it, it is, as it is, and in fact, because it's so spiritual, because it comes from God, the, the light of God, like it can't absorb the light of God because it's too overwhelming. It's, it would just overpower it and it wouldn't exist anymore. And so how does it happen? How is it able to, how is the, how are our souls able to absorb this light? This is where this light needs to come down and needs to send down a very small radiance and it needs to go down through these levels, through many contractions, uh, as we spoke about until the point that it actually creates this kind of garment that is sort of like the light itself, uh, so that it, the soul can then derive pleasure from this radiance and will be able to understand this radiance on a certain level and absorb this radiance without becoming nullified in its source. So it's so it's an, a weird thing, basically, with the, what the altar is saying is that the only way that this to overcome this hurdle of the fact that like the soul is going to become too overwhelmed in the light of God, then God has to create a garment that is going to be actually made up of kind of the same substance. It's kind of going to be like a, 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 a sort of semblance, have a sort of semblance to this initial light, uh, but, that, but that will serve at the same time as a garment for the soul to receive this light. So how can we understand this? So the altar rabbi says that we can understand this through somebody looking at the sun, but the way that they look at the sun is through a certain kind of clear glass. So what came to mind for me is like sunglasses, when you look at sunglasses. So it's weird, right? Because it's like you think about sunglasses, like you think about glass, what is glass doing? The purpose of glass is that it's translucent. It allows you to see through, it's see-through. But at the same time, this very glass, which is a see-through glass, that the purpose of the glass is to see, actually helps you see in a way that's not overwhelming. And the ultra Rebbe brings another example of this is that we see that with Moshe Rabbeinu um, in Shmot chapter 24, verse 18, where it says, that Moses entered the midst of the cloud and he ascended the mountain. So it's like basically what happened there is that like when God, when Moshe went up to receive the revelations on Har Sinai, um, he vested himself in a cloud and then he received, that's how he was able to receive all of this radiance from Hashem is that it was being absorbed through a cloud. So if you think about a cloud, what is a cloud, right? It's just made up of air. It's like, it's not, there's nothing there. There's nothing substantial. It's not like uh, we see clouds, but the cloud is just condensed um, air. So in, in this condensation, that condensation allowed him to absorb God, but yet the condensation isn't actually concealing anything in a real way. So that's kind of similar to this idea of how it is that we that uh, that our souls are able to absorb ab absorb um, God's light, um, and the Ultra Rebbe concludes, and he said that this is explained in the Zohar in the in the second part of the Zohar on page two hundred and ten and two hundred and twenty nine. So that's the end of the section today, and we're going to continue along these lines tomorrow and continue with this idea. But as we'll see, is that so with this whole analogy, the sunglasses and the cloud and all that kind of stuff, and the garment that's made up of the light itself. So it's sort of like this paradoxical kind of garment. What is that for us and our relationship with God? These this is the mitzvahs. These are the Torah laws. And that's why studying and doing these Torah laws is so essential to us being connected to God, to our source, and so essential to, um, like we need it. We need, our souls need it in order to subsist in a, in a complete way. Just like when you walk outside and it's a really sunny day, you need to put on those sunglasses. So that's it for today. And again, we will continue along these lines tomorrow and I will speak to you then. Thanks for listening to the It Is Top podcast, hosted by Sarit Switzer. This podcast is dedicated in loving memory of my maternal grandfather, Avraham Yitzhak Ben Binyamin Cohen of blessed memory. Music by Shoshana. 
If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the show, please share it with others and subscribe on YouTube, Apple iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure to leave us a five-star review. To find out more about the It Is Taught project, including more information on my soon-to-be-published book, please visit our website, itistaught.com. To catch the latest from me, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Looking forward to speaking with you tomorrow, and until then, have a great day.